Hello everybody, um, Dr Kath here again and today we're going to talk about National Marine Week. National Marine Week runs from the 24th of July until the 8th of August this year and anybody out there that's on the ball will have noticed it's not a week, it's a fortnight but that's to do with the tides. It's so that the period of National Marine Week covers everything from very low tides to high tides. So that's why it's two weeks. But you might be wondering what on earth it's got to do with Shropshire. After all, we're completely landlocked here. The closest beach to Shrewsbury is 52 miles away as the crow flies, and that's in Prestatic. Um, but the oceans cover 71% of the planet. 80% of that is completely unexplored. We know more about the surface of Venus. So there's this enormous amount of water all over the planet and we all need it. We're all connected to it. Every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you're connected to the sea. And it's the same if you're in the middle of the Gobi Desert or a remote island somewhere or on the high Arctic. We're all connected to the sea. We need it. It buffers us against climate change by absorbing carbon dioxide, which of course is the gas that um, causes the greenhouse effect. It produces oxygen. Scientists estimate that between 50 and 80 percent of the oxygen production on the whole earth comes from the ocean. And most of this is from oceanic plankton. These are drifting little tiny, tiny little plants and algae and some bacteria that can photosynthesize. And this shows you the algal spread seen from space. You can see huge concentrations of it around the Arctic and in, in other places. And this is all photosynthesizing. It, it's putting oxygen into the air. There's one particular tiny little species of plankton, which is called a prochlorococcus, it is the smallest photosynthetic organism on Earth. That little tiny bacteria produces up to 20% of the oxygen in our entire biosphere. That's more than all the tropical rainforests on land combined. So we need it, we need that oxygen. These are some of the, the, the these are minuscule plankton. The sea is full of them. You can't see them. They're microscopic, but absolutely glorious forms. They're, but they're all there working away. The sea provides food for us. Um, in this country, we don't tend to eat a huge amount of seafood, but it provides food for some of the lowest income populations in the world. And also some of the highest income. If you think about things like um, lobsters and oysters and you know, prestige foods like these, they all come from the ocean. The seaweeds also provide a small degree of food, but all of you, I can guarantee today, will have tasted some because it acts as a thickener and it's used in the production of things like toothpaste. So we need these sea products, we, we need to use them. There's lots of undiscovered stuff in the sea. Remember, 80% of it is unexplored. These are cone shells from cone snails. And there's over 900 species of them. These are fantastic things, they're, they're, they're predatorial. And how they catch their prey, which includes fish and things, is that they, fire their teeth as harpoons and they're attached to the, the, the creature on a, on, a, on a long route, a long flexible route and they fire them out into their prey and they produce neurotoxins. Each species has a different combination of neurotoxins and uh, some of them um, Paralyze the fish, or sedate the fish, or you know, they, they affect on, it, on its, in its nerve system. Means that 
it can't get away. And then the cone snail can pull the tooth back into its mouth, bring the prey item to itself, and then it can eat it. And these neurotoxins are very, very powerful. Some of them can kill a human being. And they're not big creatures. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of things about that long. Uh, but they can kill you. They're very, very powerful um, chemicals. But they've formed the basis for research into producing medicines which can deal with things like intense chronic pain, epilepsy, asthma, multiple cirrhosis. We don't know what else is in the ocean that could provide these benefits to, to mankind. I mean, it's not only that the ocean and everything in it deserves to exist in its own right. It's useful stuff. There could be something there that would cure cancers or any of the really unpleasant things that um, can happen to the human body. And um, we're all very aware that these things are very important. It also has an enormous cultural meaning to the British. We're an island nation. The Navy has always been terribly important. And art and poetry and writing reflects this. So it's, it's not only part of our life that we need this, it's, it's part of our soul as well. It's, it's important to us, even if we never go there. Most of us do, of course. And the sea is tremendously therapeutic. We all remember seaside holidays as children. It's a happy place to be. Remember the sound of the, the, the waves, the smell of the, the seaside, everything about it. So just knowing it's there is really, really important. And most of us do like to take day trips or holidays to the beach. It's somewhere we go to to relax. So we all need the sea. But it's always been there, it's always vanished. What's threatening it? The main threat is pollution. <clears throat> Ocean pollution knows no borders. 80% of it is land based. The pollution comes from the land. It can spread all over. So something that we do here can make an impact in the deep ocean right down in the Atlantic, down towards the equator, it can move around the globe. All the oceans are connected up, everything moves around in it. <clears throat> plastic pollution is insidious stuff. Every single piece of plastic that hasn't been incinerated, that's ever been made, is still around somewhere. It takes hundreds of years to decompose. 300 million tons of the stuff is produced every year, which is an equal weight of plastic as to the entire human population. 50% is single use. So that's your um, packaging for um, takeaways, drinking straws, um, food wrappers, um, even tea bags have plastic in them, some of them. Um, try and get the ones that that don't. Um, cellophane that wraps things, bits and pieces from, from offices, even the clothes you wear. Um, Man-made fibres like fleeces, acrylics, these sort of things, have plastic particles in them. And these get washed out in your washing machine and go down the drains and they end up in the water, which then ends up in the sea. Everything we do here in Shropshire that could pollute rivers and streams, could bits of litter that could go into rivers and streams, they all end up in the sea. So everything is heading oceanwards and even the microplastics out of your fleece will end up there. So it's a huge amount of stuff. 5,225 trillion pieces, pieces of plastic are in our oceans. 70% of that sinks. 15%, which is 269,000 tonnes of it floats. And there are 4 billion microfibers per kilometre squared 
below the surface. So that's the stuff. All plastic breaks down into it, so it's the microplastic those of clothing that's been washed. It's things like the um, those little bead things you get in some um, face washes and things, and it's the product of breaking down larger pieces of plastic. This is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Currents in the ocean um, can form gyres, which is a, sort of like a whirlpool shape current and gather together all this debris. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is twice the size of Texas. It's huge. Plastics there outnumber sea life by six to one. And marine life is very threatened by this. 100 million marine animals die every year from plastic waste and this can be from ingesting it. Um, turtles particularly um, will take in floating plastic bags thinking they're jellyfish which is the, the turtles main food source but filter feeders will take in the microplastics anything can end up eating it they can also get caught up in plastic waste which is of course um, they can't hunt or if they're a, an, an air breathing species like, um, like cetaceans the seals and things they'll drown so it's all this plastic in the ocean is having a huge impact. These, these are the, the microplastic um, particles which the, the larger items degrade into. Um, they attract pollution themselves. So persistent organic pollutants like pesticides and things will be attracted to these pieces of plastic and build up on them. Remember those little beads, they'll be eaten from everything from tiny krill to basking sharks. So all this and the pollutants it carries are going into the food chain. And that's not just the food chain for the marine animals, it's also the food chain for people. Remember all that seafood. So these are things that are well worth avoiding. It's tiny beads think of that each little tiny bead floating in the ocean covered in persistent organic pesticide plastics are colonized by bacteria as well so um particularly with the raised carbon dioxide levels that the seeds taking in it means that beneficial bacteria are declining and the harmful sorts are thriving in the sea Here's your example. This is a thing called a larvacean. And a larvacean is a pre swimming tunicate, which is related to sea squirts and these sort of things. And the bits you see in the middle there that looks a little like a slightly deformed tadpole is the creature itself. And it makes a home for itself, or um, actually a feeding web, out of mucus. So it lives inside this big web of mucus which sur it surrounds the creature and it, it works as a, as a net to catch plankton in and this it gets clogged up it gets fouled because the creature is not only eating the plankton from it it's also excreting into it so it discards its test its shell of mucus three or four times a day and builds a new one. The remains of it sink to the, the, the ocean floor and it accounts for a significant fraction of the organic material which is reaching the depths. If its web gets clogged up with microplastics, it can't survive. It can't eat them. Another problem is nutrients going into the water, eutrophication. A huge amount of global marine product pollution comes from agricultural runoff, sewage, untreated, untreated, the discharge of nutrients and pesticides into the water. The Mississippi, on its own, discharges 1.5 million tonnes of nitrogen pollution into the Gulf of Mexico every year. And this leads to plankton blooms. All that increased nitrogen 
encourages the growth of planktons, which form what they call red tides, also brown tides and green tides. And you've all heard about toxic red tides. These harmful algal blooms have tripled since 1984. This is a, a, a green one, um, not quite as unsightly, but the same idea. And they lead to dead zones. All that plankton will eventually die, or it's it, it, it'll it'll the, the toxic bits will kill plankton, and decomposition of it is reliant on oxygen. So they take the oxygen out of the water. This leads to what they call marine hypoxia, uh, which refers to 25% or lower of the normal oxygen level you would find in the water. That's less available oxygen than there is in the death zone on Everest. The Baltic has a dead zone about the size of Ireland, despite real efforts to cut down agricultural runoff. This is things like um, when there's been heavy rain, soil is taken into the rivers, it takes with it any pesticides and herbicides and also nutrients that have been put into the, into the soil. So particularly um, sort of slurries and artificial fertilizers, the muck spreading doesn't tend to have quite the same effect. It's really important to look after the rivers and stop these runoffs getting into them because then it won't get into the sea. So not only does it harm the river, it's also harming the oceans. You can't see it. This low oxygen water sinks, it hugs the bottom of the ocean. The surface can be teeming with life, but the bottom of the ocean can be completely dead. This is a coral reef that has died. It's bleached. Obviously, this is an important habitat for lots and lots of different creatures, and it's lost because it's died off. Other pollutants include various toxins, the runoffs from pesticides on the land, pharmaceuticals that go into the water, um, these sort of things. Oil is particularly dangerous. This is, you know, mostly comes from shipping, um, from some disastrous oil spills, but also just generally from um, even using a small outboard motor. Um, and run off from the land, from oil that's gone onto, onto the road from cars and has gone into the drains. So the oil reduces the capacity of all those little microorganisms to photosynthesize. So they're producing less oxygen and they're taking up less carbon dioxide. Now remember, these are important things at the moment, important things all the time really, but with climate change, we'll come onto it in a bit. These are really important. Toxic metals can come from industrial discharge, factories, power stations, mining. Some of the some of the mining processes are particularly dirty, and all sorts of things can end up in the water because of that. So waste dumps. What about waste dumps? Well, you might think, well, we've got one in the middle of Shropshire. It's not going to affect the sea. It will, because all the stuff that's decomposing leaches into the groundwater, which then goes into the brooks, the streams, the drains, into the river, and off it goes and ends up in the sea. So even what you do here in the middle of Shropshire is tied up with the condition of the ocean. What you do in the middle of the Gobi Desert is tied up with the ocean. So don't ever think that just because you're here in a landlocked country, county, you're not going to have any effect. Noise pollution is another danger to sea life, it's particularly to the, the, the whales and dolphins, things that are relying on sonar and sound to be able to hear mates, to communicate with each other and to find their food. So more shipping, more noise, noise disturbance. Sea's, sea's having a bit of a tough time, isn't it? 
about climate change then? It's another threat to the sea. It's our buffer, but it's affected by climate change. The sea is becoming more acid. As carbon dioxide dissolves into the seawater, it forms carbonic acid, which is a pretty weak acid, but it's enough to alter the pH of the seawater. The seawater would naturally be slightly alkaline because of the salt in it. Since the Industrial Revolution, there's been a 30% in acidity in the top layers of the ocean, which affects the chemistry of the seawater and the organisms that rely on it. And here's our example for this one. This is a sea butterfly. Uh, I very much doubt anyone will, will have ever seen one. They're tiny little creatures. Um, they're, they're little, um, same sort of family as, as in a broad family is things like sort of periwinkles and stuff, but these swim in the ocean. Uh, their feet, they're called, um, they're, 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 where would be the sole of the foot of it has evolved into little wings, so it's a free swimming organ organism. And they have very, very thin shells. These things are plankton feeders, they fire out a plankton net which catches plankton in it and then they ingest it and they live in these buoyant little shells so they, they they're, they're neutrally buoyant they sort of bob around in the water and they can flick their little wings to escape from predators and things absolutely incredible dainty beautiful little things but they have such thin shells that acidification of the water can dissolve them so these things are threatened. There's thousands of them, millions of them, trillions of them, particularly up around the Arctic and places like that. They're important food sources, and they're also laying up that calcium carbonate shell, which will take the carbon when they die down to the seafloor and act as a carbon sink. So these are tied up in the whole process of the oceans buffering us from climate change. All the shellfish use calcium carbonate to make their shells because acidic water has less calcium carbonate as well as starting to dissolve the shells it makes it much more difficult for these things to even create their shells so it's a big impact and remember those cone shells that have the potential to allow us to cure things like multiple sclerosis, they're threatened by this. These are um, coccolithophores, which are little um, microscopic creatures with these little fancy shells built out of calcium carbonate. They're a big part of the food chain. And don't forget, they're taking the carbon down to the seabed, keeping it safe there, not releasing it to the atmosphere, it's a carbon sink. Rising temperatures, we might all think if the sea's a bit warmer, it might be nicer to swim in, but they have a big impact on the creatures that live there and the food chains surrounding them. So our example for this one is a puffin. Everybody knows what a puffin looks like. Very cute little birds, extremely nice. And we get these pictures of them with great rows of sand, sand eels held in their beaks. And they look quite comical. They're, they're absolutely charming. You get them on teapots and tea towels and this sort of thing. And you go out and watch them and enjoy them. And the image of them with their stroppy, wonderful, colourful beak and all the sand eels is absolutely archetypal. These are the sand eels they live on. Tiny little thin fish that swim in great shoals. And they themselves live on these things. These are called copepods. And these are tiny little, more of the microscopic planktonic things. These are zooplankton, little microscopic animals that swim in the sea. The problem for the puffins and other seabirds that depend on these um, sand eels is that copepods are quite particular about what sort of water they like to swim in. There's lots and lots of different sorts, and you find them everywhere from the Arctic to the equator and the Antarctic to the, to the equator. But they they're fussy, and the ones 
that have sustained these huge shoals of sand eels breed in the springtime when it encourages a, 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 a mass of sand eels which is good for the seabirds they've been replaced they've gone north they don't like warm seas so they've moved north and the ones that have come from further south also moving north to avoid the warmth are a different species and they breed in the autumn and this has had a huge impact on the number of sand eels that are, that are breeding in the ocean and that are available to our seabirds so you can see just a small change can make an enormous knock-on effect i mean the, the rising temperatures might mean that we're catching different fish around the around the shores you know, sort of sardines and red mullet and things that usually come from much further south but the impact on the nature we love around the shores is huge melting ice is a problem melting ice from the glaciers and ice and and and, and, and major ice sheets is contributing to sea level rise slowly the melt is accelerating but the melted sea ice, sea ice, is the ice that's floating on the water and builds up around the Arctic, is much more important for marine creatures. Things like polar bears rely on it, the seals fall out on it, the polar bears hunt them there. Without that, these creatures really have very little chance. So melting ice is a, a bad thing. It's also weakens the ocean currents. Now this is usually referred to as the ocean conveyor belt and they make it look very simple but actually it, it's all got spirals and gyres and all sorts of things sprouting off to the side. <clears throat> it's really important for redistributing nutrients in the sea and the winds push from the warm equator up towards the poles and they drag surface water with them. The water towards the poles it gets colder and it gets denser. So it sinks and the surface water that's being pushed behind pushes it down. The warmer water goes on top and pushes down this dense colder water. It's pushed back towards the equator. And as it goes, it warms up, it gets less dense, and so it rises as it goes. And it's transporting and mixing the nutrients. It's providing food. This is why things like um, some of these big ocean currents are followed by sea creatures. Um, <clears throat> the Humboldt current, for example, going up through the Pacific. The nutrients in it that are brought from the Antarctic are followed by sea creatures all the way up to the coast of America. So it's an important provider of food for everything in the whole worldwide oceans. Without the driving downward force of the colder water, the denser water at the poles, this whole system can break down. In 2018, scientists were suggesting that major currents in the Atlantic had slowed by 15%. This is the Gulf Stream. This is what keeps us warm. This far north, we should be an awful lot colder, but we have the Gulf Stream keeping us warmer. Some studies reckon that it could worsen by more than 30% by 2100. These make significant changes to the world's atmosphere, and particularly the weather. If this breaks down, winters in England will be much, much colder. Uh, they, even the monsoon cycles, which are so important for agriculture in, in the tropics, could break down. So ocean currents are, we can't see them, don't feel them very much, really, really important to all of us. Because warm water holds less gas, and the disruption of currents limit the amount of oxygen 
is trans that's transported from the surface to the depths, um, and we get algal blooms and the eutrophication we talked about earlier. It's all deoxygenic in water. The other thing about warmth is warm things expand. As the water gets warmer, it expands. And this at the moment is the main thing that's causing sea level rise. Between 1993 and 2010, thermal expansion raised sea levels by 1.1 millimeter, which doesn't sound like very much. But remember, as it gets warmer, it's going to get faster and it causes a threat to coastal communities and habitats, people, people living in coastal places, remember, particularly in third world countries, but also environments, habitats that we cherish for what they do for wildlife around the country. This is the, the, the mud flats. These are absolutely incredible. The one meter cubed of mud has 200,000 tiny creatures living in it, which is enough worms and shellfish to contribute the calorific value of 16 Mars bars. These are the places that our waders, the oyster catchers, the curlews, um, the little dunlins, sandlings, they live here. And they come inshore to breed. So don't forget that some of our birds that we see in Shropshire, the curlews and things, are dependent on these habitats in the winter. So if we lose these, we're going to lose a lot of our waders too. Salt marshes, similar thing. Loads and loads of food for different sorts of animals. Some of them fare all year round, and some of them migrating. So it's important. This is really, really crucial stuff. The food chain can collapse. This is really basic. This is basic to us, particularly to people in areas with um, that rely on fishing, um, places that are either economic exploitation of fish or people that um, need it because that's the only food they can get. What happens is the, um, the, the productivity changes. So there is a, 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 a the eventual outcome is that the secondary consumers like the fish and the lobsters and the crabs and these sort of things get less and less because primary production um it starts off that squeezes then you lose the primary consumers then you lose the um secondary consu uh, consumers which are the things we want to eat and as that happens you get because the, the 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 primary producers, the algae and the the, the the planktons and things like that, can breed fast, you end up with an enormous overproductivity of those, and the things at the top of the food chain, like the um, I mean maybe you have a nice tuna fish sandwich for lunch, things like that, salmon, um, lobsters, all these sort of larger creatures, end up being pressured end up with much less at the top of the food chain where we want to collect it. And also where there are these big spectacular creatures existing in their own right. So don't think of it just as, well, we can stop eating tuna fish. Think of it that the tuna fish have reason to exist, you know. <clears throat> Overfishing. This is adding to the food chain problems <clears throat> these are i mean you think of the food chain you think of the puffins and the sand eels and the copepods and they're, they're, they're not the sand eels aren't aren't going into our food chain they are collected for use as, as fertilizer what a waste but despite the fact that the drop in the total amount of fish that can be caught sustainably has, has, has gone down really since the 1930s. 
um, you know, the Sea of Japan, for example, has a 35% reduction in fishery size. They're still doing it. They're still fishing and finding more and more ways of catching greater numbers of fish. This is paired trawlers. So two trawlers drag this enormous net and between them they can catch more than if they'd both been individually trawling. So these things are particularly dangerous to sea creatures. There's a, a high bycatch, particularly of um, dolphins, cetaceans, these sort of things, because they're not dragging directly behind the boat. They can collect all sorts of things that um, might have tried to avoid them otherwise. So paired fishing is bad. The great um, huge factory ships that are dredging up every kind of fish and quotas don't really help. Once it's in that net, it's not going to survive. If the quota won't allow you to take it home and market it, it's going to get thrown over the side. So quotas don't help. Seafloor dredging is even more destructive. They, they, this is dredging for, for fish low down in the sea, and this is chain dredging for things like um, scallops. Uh, and it's dragging basically a, a load of chain across the ocean bed, and this wrecks the ocean floor habitat. An example this time is a thing called a flame shell which is a little bivalve, and this is at Loch Caron, which is in Western Ross in the Western Highlands. And these are flame shell beds. Flame shells are absolutely incredible things. They, they're a, a habitat engineer. They're a keystone species. They, they build a habitat. They, they make little nests in the, hidden in the seabed, and they build them out of shells and stones and other materials. and, and, and combined with, with, with mucus and they, they, they crowd together so there, there can be hundreds of nests combining to form a dense bed and it raises the seabed of it, it stabilizes it and makes it attractive to other creatures. It's a priority marine feature in Scotland's seas and provides habitat for all sorts of things, increases biodiversity and it's critically important it should be protected. But dredged, it takes out all of that biodiversity. A study in Loch Fine found six nest complexes of these creatures supported 19 species of algae and 265 species of invertebrate. So they're, they're making a whole habitat. All it needs is one of those scalp chains to dredge across it, and you've lost it. There it is on the right, dredged. And this is a like this is this is what the flame shell looks like when it's alive and well. This sort of like orange furry thing in the middle, absolutely incredible stuff. But surrounded by other creatures that are thriving on the habitat it's formed. So this could all be completely de be destroyed by inappropriate fishing in, the appropriate, in inappropriate places and inappropriate ways. Even pleasure craft can make a difference. These are, um, the seahorses in Sutherland Bay live on these eelgrass beds, which have been badly disturbed really by pleasure boats, anchoring in the wrong places, people diving in the wrong places. It's now a marine conservation zone. We'll talk about those in, in a little while, but they're not terribly well policed, they're difficult to police, and there is still disruption to the habitat. Coming to the end of the doom and gloom just now, uh, invasive non native species. This is a mitten crab. They have these sort of strange furry mittens on their claws. There are 3,000 different marine species transported around the globe in 12 billion tonnes of ballast fuel for every year. And these things, as the oceans warm up, can thrive in completely the wrong places. So we've got these Chinese metal crabs, came in in ballast water, um, 
which of course gets drained out once when the ship is is, is reloaded and these things have um colonized particularly the thames and medway um they 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 breed in the estuaries and then go up river so they're aggressive they're threatening not our, our, our you know things like the white claw crayfish they destroy habitat other things like japanese skeleton shrimps they're aggressive predators and they're out competing uh, and of course they don't have natural curves because their predators have been left behind so like all invasive invasive non-natives they are not a good thing so another form of pollution and climate warming is helping it by warming the water so okay that's the doom and gloom but what can we do about it <coughs> all of us can do something to help we can reduce our own carbon footprint use the car less walk more um, we can take the bus take the train we can avoid single-use plastics you know those nice little bags they give you to put your vegetables in um tell them tell them you don't want them tell them what paper bags plastic straws who needs plastic straws everything you use you can think reduce reuse recycle make sure you sort out your rubbish anything you can recycle do get things in glass bottles rather than plastic ones all usual never-ending advice if you like i don't need to tell you this you know this already if you're watching this you know this already buy sustainable seafood stuff that is caught in a sustainable way from sustainable stocks ask the fishmonger about it it usually has labeled on tins what is sustainable try different seafood try eating locally produced stuff that maybe you wouldn't have tried before um, it used to be, I remember when I was a kid, really the thing you got was things like cod and haddock. And of course, they'd be, not only are they driven north into cold water, but they're also um, quite threatened now. They've been overfished. So try different species. If, if, if the fishmonger's got something that you, you don't recognise, ask them about it. He'll tell you how to cook it. Um, he'll tell you how to use it. But try something different. And lobby the government for action. Political will can really turn things around, and the ocean is capable of recovering. Natural systems are really good at recovering, but it needs strategies based on law, policy, technology, targeted enforcement to encourage proper behaviour to protect the oceans. We need to push the government. We need to make sure they know we're not happy with this and that something needs to be done. Remember, we all need to see. Clean Air Act, waste management, sorting, recycling, ban on plastic, single use plastics, cleaner energy, reducing industrial and agricultural discharges, and extending marine protected areas all helps marine protected areas really need to be protected it's very difficult to, to police them it's like the no fish zones you know but they need the, the the there's no point having these things on paper they need to have teeth we need to do something about it so do something about it shout at your mp that you're concerned about the state of the ocean think of what you do and how it can affect the state of the ocean we can all do something to help it. And don't forget, as usual, one of the things you can do is join Shropshire Wildlife Trust, which might not sound as if it does very much for oceans, but the Wildlife Trust all together make a big lobbying group to pressurise the government to look after the environment. So the more members we have, the louder we can shout. So if you're not a member already, think about joining us. The whole family can join for only five pounds a month, which is 
less than one portion of cotton chips at seaside fish and chip shops. 